Hi, everyone. Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for hopping on tonight. This is my first ever live, so I'm super excited. A little bit nervous, but we're going to get through it. Um, feel free to type out any questions you have kind of as we go through it, and then at the end, too, we'll um, leave room for questions. Um, okay, so my name's Holly Osborne. I am an occupational therapist. We have Tylee, Tylee, UJPT alum too. All right. Um, so, um, I'm an occupational therapist here at Beyond Boundaries and I have been in OT for, I think about 13, years. I don't really know. 13 years. Um, and I started working in pediatric incontinence and pelvic floor in 2018. So um, right after I joined the Beyond Boundaries team, I got certified in that. And our team also consists of Brittany Anderson, who's a PT. We have Stacey Reek, who's a PT, and then um, Samantha Engelhard, who's an OT. Also, LaDonna Bannock, who is our boss, um, she's also trained as well um, and helps out um, if we need it. So we, um, we, sorry, my kids are in the background also. So, <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Part of what I wanted to talk about tonight was just um, what is incontinence? What is, um, what type of work we do in pediatric pelvic floor? Um, so when we think about, um, incontinence, we think about whether a child, um, what's the bed. Um, maybe they have daytime incontinence. So that would be like, you know, not being able to hold in their pee and their poop during the day. Um, we also, talk a lot about constipation and how that can affect so many different things. Um, so those are the four kind of main concerns that we would see if a child was coming into our program. Um, what makes us really, really unique in the community and one of the reasons I just like love this team is we use this coordinated approach to treat um, any type of these bowel and bladder dysfunctions. So we use both OT and PT to treat. Um, we do our evaluation together. And then that gives us a much better idea of what is really going on with the child. With kids, it is not that cut and dry. It's typically not just muscle and it's typically not just behavior. There's so much more going on. And so doing the evaluation together and treating together allows us the opportunity to really put all those puzzle pieces together. Um, we, um, so kind of going back to some of the diagnoses that we would see. So for example, bedwetting, we typically get children between the ages of four all the way up to, I think we've had kids up to age 12 in our program. And when they come in with bedwetting, it's typically not just bedwetting. There's usually something going on like constipation. Um, it might be a behavioral thing. It might be that they just don't want to get up, but usually it's more than that. So we're treating um, the constipation as well as the pelvic floor muscles so that the child is able to hold in the pee during the night when they're sleeping but also be able to let all the pee out during the day. Um, and then we might also work on some things like what are they eating and drinking? Because that can affect not only their bladder function, but it can impact constipation as well. Um, we also see kids with any daytime leaks. So we when kids have a, a urinary leak, we call them leaks in our clinic, not accidents. Um, when they have a leak, that's a urinary leak, we um, are looking more at what are the muscles doing? 
Are they not able to hold in their pee during the day because their muscles are fatiguing? Or are they not able to activate the muscles um, when they feel that urge coming on? And so um, this is something we, we see a lot in kids who are very active in different sports. Um, maybe, you know, gymnasts. Um, we notice that uh, more with their pelvic floor. We also... Um, just other kids who are super active with sports because they're putting so much energy into some of the other muscles that those pelvic floor muscles are um, maybe not as strong. Um, and then we also have, um, we call them poop leaks. Um, this is usually a result of chronic um, constipation. So what happens is when you're constipated, you get a big mass in your um your rectum when your body produces new poop which it does constantly that poop is liquid and it goes around um the solid mass and so that comes out as just like a smear um but it's not something that kids can typically even um control so we do see that quite a bit but it, like i said that usually is a result of constipation so we're also treating that with constipation treatment, we are doing a ton of different um, massages on the belly, on different valves. We work with the families a lot on how to get the child on a good routine. Are they going to the bathroom when they need to go? Um, what are they eating and drinking again? Um, and then working, too, again, on those um, pelvic floor muscles so that they can relax. A lot of kids with constipation it comes from um, holding. So we get a lot of um, younger kids when it comes to simple, like not simple, but just if it's just a constipation issue, um, those kids are typically younger and we see that they're really afraid to use the toilet. And so some of that sensory processing work can be valuable as well with them. Um and so, yeah, we're working kind of through that fear response. We're working on positioning on the toilet, helping them to get the poop out when it needs to come out so that that constipation doesn't happen. I have a few more people that joined while I was chatting. Dakota and Stacy and Jessica and Tiana. Thank you guys for joining. Um, are there any questions kind of as I'm going through this, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to touch on um, is that this is a very uncomfortable, um, it can be very scary situation for families and kids to be in. You know, often by the time they're seeking out any help, their parents are you know, beyond frustrated with what's going on. They're tired of changing the sheets all the time. They're tired of changing um, dirty underwear. And the kids are also frustrated. You know, we get kiddos who are approaching the age of going to sleepovers or summer camp and they can't go because, you know, they still wet the bed. Um, kids who are starting kindergarten who are still having poop leaks in their underwear. So when they get to us, our goal is to make families and kids feel as comfortable as possible talking about this, um, but also working through it. And so that's one thing that I love about our team is we just do such a good job of making everybody feel comfortable. We utilize different songs and different books. Um, we have different games that are, you know, shooting the poop into the toilet and the flamingo that poops in the toilet. Um, so it's really, um, it really helps kind of break the ice. We have poop emojis all over our room and we have different things that, you know, sing about poop. And so I think the kids also really seem to um, feel a lot more comfortable in that situation as well. Okay, we have a question from Kristen. How can you tell if the leaking is related to urgency or not? Oh, I can't see the rest of the question. My daughter. Oh, 
My daughter has very small leaks that she does not notice, but we can smell it when we check her clothes. She is 10 and being treated for chronic constipation. She used to have pee accidents, and now we are down to the small leaks, but unsure what's causing it at this point. Um, so the leaking, um, there it can be a combination of the chronic constipation, like I mentioned before, but then also, yes, if you're getting a sudden urge to go, um, and your body's not able to contract those muscles to hold it in, then the leaks will happen. Um, the other thing is to note is that kids often don't notice these leaks. Um, it's kind of like if you were to put like a, a wet washcloth, say on your arm, at first you would feel it. And then as time went on, you would just not even notice that. So that's kind of the same thing. They just, it happens so frequently to kids that they just don't even notice that there is a leak. Um, and so I hope that answers your question. Um, but let me know if, if I missed something there. But yes, the, a lot of times we get kids who aren't noticing it. And so that's part of like some of our foundational skills is to get kids to notice when, you know, what an urge feels like. What, what does it feel like if, if they're wet or dry? So some of that interoception um, component as well. Um, let's see. I'm just looking over here to my, <laughs> my guide. Do you want to talk about potty training? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about potty training. Um, we are – our program is not designed to be a potty training program. Um, so our criteria for kids who are coming into the program is usually we want them to be – at least age three, um, three or four, four is better. Um, we typically will say that, you know, we want them to have been, tra have already been potty trained with a regression or actively trying to potty train for, I would say, about six months without any progress. So it's very common for kids to come in who have been um, trained during the day, but we're still struggling with the nighttime. Um, we have kids who are able to be pee trained, but the poop is a big concern, um, not pooping on the potty. So there are pieces of that that, you know, if they're not completely potty trained, we will um, still see them. As far as actual potty training goes, my um, OT brain um, just, you know, I encourage parents, if you're going to potty train, to just commit and run with it. Um, I think we've seen more success when we can really devote all of that time to them and be consistent rather than potty training over, you know, multiple months. So, um, okay, we have another question. Um, let's see. Can you talk more about the role of OT versus PT in the assessment and treatment sessions? All right. So, okay. Um, so, okay. With our, um, I'll start with PT. So PT, um, when they come into an assessment, when a child comes in, our PTs um, do all of the muscle testing. Um, they look at endurance of the muscle. So whole body um, muscle testing and endurance. They look at different um, postures. Um, they do some sensory testing, like the dermatomes. Um, and then they specifically do the biofeedback. So the, the biofeedback, which um, we, is a tool we use to measure muscle function of the pelvic floor. Um, they also um, will do some of the ultrasound as well. Um, usually we do that during the treatment. Um, and then as far as OT during the assessment, we, um, okay. Um, sorry, we're having technical difficulties, but I think we got it fixed. Um, so during the assessment, the OT, OT's role is to do most of the child and parent interview, um, asking about, um, diet, routine, any emotional dysregulation, any fears, um, how is their hygiene, 
Um, and then during treatment, the OT's job then is to um, work on wiping, work on posture, sitting on the toilet. We educate a lot on the diet, um, educate a lot on routine. Where all of our OTs and PTs are trained in the same course for um, pelvic floor function, we have um, a PT and then myself who's also trained in some functional GI disorders. So with that, we're looking more at um, the pooping part of it. And then we're all trained in um, use of ultrasound to find the bladder and the bowel. So hopefully that helped um, answer that question. Let's see. Back to the previous question. How do we know if her leaking is related to constipation or urgency? Wondering if we need to do another bowel cleanout or something else. Um, so as far as the bowel cleanout goes, I would definitely talk with the pediatrician about that. Um, you know, we always, our goal in our program is to get the poop out. So our kind of philosophy is that we can't really treat, um, you know, pelvic floor function if we don't have a cleaned out bowel um, or as cleaned out as we can because when you have poop in your bowels um, over time those bowels are stretched out and so um, I think you know just based on what you're telling me Kristen I would go with the leaking is related to the constipation at this point um, and so if you want to you can always message us um, and we can get back to you through like private messaging if you want to um, talk more about that. We also do free screens. So, you know, if you're ever wanting more ideas or wondering what the next step is, we can do a screen over the phone and go from there. Um, okay. So I think I answered all the questions or all the stuff about the role of OT versus PT. So we're just basically using our, you know, scope of practice there to differentiate, but the reason we like to do the coordinated approach so much is because there's so many different aspects um, that, you know, as an OT, I'm not seeing all of the muscle component that a PT would and vice versa. The PTs, you know, maybe not seeing all the sensory component that an OT would. So that's why we like to utilize that approach. Here. Um, of the toilet? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're just talking about um, <clears throat> touching a little bit more on that fear of using the toilet. I talked about how that happens a lot with younger kids. Um, kids develop fears of the toilet for many reasons. It could be that, the, you know, they heard um, the toilet flush one time and they don't ever want to hear it again. It could be because there's a giant hole in the toilet. Um, sometimes the idea of poop leaving their body and disappearing forever is very scary for kids. Um, we also know that if kids have a traumatic experience with potty training, that can lead to fear. So again, you know, we just try and really, um, kind of approach that delicately Our, you know, we, we never want to add more fear to them. So we start, you know, pretty basic, like, can they even be in the bathroom? So we actually will sometimes take our stuff into the bathroom and, play games in there just so that they're exposed to it. Um, you know, we don't go from pooping in our pull-up to pooping in the toilet overnight. Um, and, you know, we make sure that parents know that as well, that we um, we can kind of progress that along in a very systematic and um, sensitive way with kids. Um, let's see. We have another question or another. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a little guy that's four and has struggled with bowel movements. He will have several small poo accidents each day. It seems like the accidents stop once he has a full bowel movement, but a couple of days later, we're back to having lots of accidents. All right. So um, this goes back to, we call it the constipation carousel. So our um, bowels or our rectum starts out pretty small. I'll show you. I actually have a model here. Here's a model of the rectum. So it starts out pretty small. Over time, as kids become constipated, the rectum stretches out and stretches out. 
Um, when a child poops or relieves themselves, however often it might be, the rectum will shrink back to its normal size. But if that keeps happening, the rectum keeps growing. And as it shrinks back, it kind of becomes a little bit more like flabby and it doesn't go back to its normal shape. So it's basically like a big holding tank for poop. Um, so this is super common where kids will come in with constipation. They'll have a good bowel movement for about two to three days. They're fine. And then like a week later, we start to see the same symptoms happening again. And so our treatment approach with that is to work on com- like constantly emptying the bowels, um, but then pairing that with the pelvic floor um, activation, endurance, all that. So um, and then as well as like relaxing. So that um, that is very common. Um, we could definitely talk more as well if you wanted to do that screening. We could see kind of what what is next for him but you know to get started it's always good to just make sure that they're emptying as much as possible um usually after they eat is the best time to do that a great resource um is um gikids.org and that will um that has a great video on constipation and that leaking piece of it um all right kristen miller well, thanks for the, we're ha- we're going to be excited to, um, see your little one. Um, <clears throat> let's see if any more questions. Okay. Anything else we want to, yeah. So, um, I was also just going to share, um, a couple examples of kids who maybe Um, have come in and different just testimonials about um, what their family experienced with us as well. Um, So one of the, the kids that we came in, um, she, um, she was a bedwetter, um, eight years old, came in super, super nervous. um, Didn't really want anything to do with our program. um, And her, she did end up graduating from the program um, and her mom wrote that, you know, she just knew um, that Beyond Boundaries was the right place. They, we were patient, kind, brought a positive feel to the situation and that after they left the evaluation, her daughter was hopeful and excited to start therapy. Her confidence soared and her outlook turned positive. Um, We've also um, had parents, or another parent said we were both sort of discouraged and not sure this would work since nothing else had in the past. I am amazed by how far he has come. It's so crazy. We are already graduating. I'm not sure what kind of magic you have, but you helped him work so, helped him work so hard with this. Um, We have quite a few, you know, success stories and we've seen kids who, kind of just touching on that confidence piece, we have seen kids completely become different kids from this program. Um, We had a a boy who was um, 10 with some significant amount of trauma in his past. And he came in and he didn't smile. He didn't talk to us. Um, He was still, you know, wearing a pull-up to school. And when he graduated, it was like a completely different child. He was beaming from ear to ear. And those are the moments when I just, I mean, I'm so passionate about this program anyways, but those are the moments where it just like hits me on what we're doing for this community and for the families in it. Um, so Brittany, um, when you call, um, to set up a consult, just let them know that you are calling about the pediatric incontinence program and that you wanted to speak to somebody more about it. Um, and then, um, I will give you a call as soon as I get, get that information. So, um, all right. So, like I said, we, oops. okay. Like I said, we do offer 
free screenings. You can just call our office. Um, it's 701-356-0062. And just let them know you're calling for the pediatric incontinence screening. Um, myself or one of the other team members will get back to you. Um, and then we'll talk through some of the symptoms that your child might be having um, and help you kind of navigate on where to go next. Um, we um, we do um, bill our evaluations and our treatment through insurance. So um, we have, you know, once we kind of get that screening and intake process started, we'll have somebody call you to talk about the cost, um, out-of-pocket costs or what insurance will bill for you. Um, and, you know, we um, we do offer teletherapy as an option to do treatment. Our goal is that they would come into the clinic for the evaluation. Um, and then, you know, we can do teletherapy. It's nice if you're within driving distance, if we can do, um, you know, maybe every fourth or fifth visit in the clinic to get more like, you know, eyes on, hands on stuff. Um, but um, we do offer teletherapy for North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, and then, yeah, we, you know, we do once a week sessions. Um, so um, one more thing I was trying to think of when I was talking about teletherapy, but I lost it. So and then just a couple resources for any parents out there who might be you know, have kids struggling with this. This book is called It's No Accident. Um, it's by Steve Hodges. It's just a really great book on, um, as a parent, how to navigate it. Um, and then we have the ins and outs of poop. So this is really just more geared towards the constipation. And this is by Thomas Duhamel. So the ins and outs of poop. And it's no accident. Um, all right, guys. Thank you all. I think that was all we had. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Thanks so much. Bye.